I get the privilege this morning of reading scripture. And I don't know about you, but every time I, I get the opportunity, it just fills my heart with a lot of joy. So um, this morning, we're going to read Jeremiah 31 in the Old Testament, 31 through 34. And if you want to follow along in the Bibles in your pew, it is on page 735. But if you don't, just sit back. Here we go. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with the ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke. Though I was their husband, says the Lord, but this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another, or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. The word of the Lord. The second reading, oops, hang on. The second reading is from John, and we're going to be reading John uh, 12, 20 through 33. This one is just a little bit longer, so I'll try and do this on my phone. We'll see how we do. Now, were there some Greeks? There were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the festival. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with a request. Sir, they said, we'd like to see Jesus. Philip went to tell Andrew, and Andrew and Philip, in turn, told Jesus. And Jesus replied, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed, but if it dies, it produces many seeds. Anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servants will also be. My Father will honor the one who serves me. Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. No, it was for this very reason that I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. And then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. And the crowd that was there and heard it said it had thundered. Others said an angel had spoken to him. And Jesus said, this voice was for your benefit, not mine. Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. And he said this to show the kind of death he was going to die. The word of the Lord. My husband Dave and I got four chances to raise children. You hear about them every once in a while. I can't help myself. And even though I got lots of professional training to be a teacher, um, I went through all kinds of counseling courses to be a good counselor. I understood theories of development and all these kinds of things. I found that each of our children were different and they each needed a different plan emotionally, spiritually, and intellectually. And our goal, Dave and myself, probably just like you, was to raise healthy, moral adults who loved God, who loved themselves and others, including their parents. But from early on, we could agree on one thing, which 
with all four of our children. We were going to give them choices to try to help them learn to listen to themselves, to God's voice. And it started with peas or carrots. And it was always carrots. Carrots or squash. Some liked carrots, some liked squash. What extracurricular activity do you want to participate in this semester? You only get one. Which one? This pair of pants or this pair of pants? Lots of choices. That goal again, that they would learn to make good choices. And we as parents were an external voice, seeking to raise up these children who would learn this voice of conscience. And our prayer was that they would learn to listen to the very voice of God and God's desires. But you see, external voices are very loud and demanding. And oftentimes they have rules. And there are consequences if you break the rules. As a youth group leader, for many years, even before I had children, there were many parents who were always nagging their youth, yelling, demanding, and as a youth group leader, I realized that, or I thought that if these kids left home and were finally free, they might go a little bit crazy. And you know what happened over and over again? That was absolutely true. And there were drug addictions, and there were pregnancies, and all kinds of things from these parents who railed at their children, that were so loud in their heads that these children were never able to hear in their hearts. How great to raise children that you can trust. And they know it. It is so privileged. It's such a privilege to have teenagers who know that you trust them with our cars and with other things in our lives. Because you trust them because they've earned your trust. So my question this morning as we enter this sermon is, can God trust human beings? to carry out God's plan for us. A plan stated very clearly, love God, love your neighbor as yourself. And so as we conclude this Lenten sermon series today on foundations of faith, we fall on our knees and give thanks for a new covenant sealed in the life and death and resurrection of Jesus the Christ. Because we as human beings were not able to keep our side of the old covenants. Will you join me in prayer? Oh God, your word sets a foundation for us to live and move and have our being. Help us to continue to examine the foundation, the bricks, the rocks that you give us to stand on. So we offer praise to you this morning as we examine the new covenant in Jesus the Christ. Amen. So covenants were cut between God and human beings. And in those covenants, human beings always had a role and choices. And God sent prophets along the way to guide and to chide the people. And then there were priests who instituted lots and lots of rules. We read about those in the Leviticus and Deuteronomy. And they told people how to dress and sleep and bathe and celebrate. All these external voices. And the goal was purity in life. So that one could be present before God to worship and serve. And then as recorded in biblical history, the priests were often compromised by scandal. And then kings, I don't think God really ever wanted kings for God's people. They were trouble from the start. Elected, appointed people got into trouble. Who could be trusted? Who could lead God's people? God gives ten commandments, ten words, written on stone and kept in a hallowed temple. And we know that they were memorized and recited from generation to generation. I still remember my dad, Adrian Martin, 
reciting the Ten Commandments, commandments as I was on his shoulder and him, I must have been crying, <laughs> him patting my back. The Ten Commandments and the Beatitudes way in the recesses of my memory. And the trouble for Jeremiah and the people of Judah is that the temple where these holy stones, these Ten Commandments, were kept has been destroyed, and the stones have disappeared, probably carried off to Babylon. And the question becomes, has God disappeared, or has God given up on us? As we read Jeremiah, those are questions that we see. Or have the people been so disobedient that all of the covenants are broken? Are they null and void? Well, says Jeremiah, things are looking pretty bad here for us in Judah, but there is a day coming when all the external voices, the roles, the laws will no longer be needed. Rather, God will make a new covenant with Israel, and the law will be written on hearts. No longer shall external voices say, know the Lord, learn this, do that, for they shall all know me. So God has a new plan. God is going to come and walk in our shoes and live in our skin. Fully God, fully human, Jesus. And God's plan in Jesus will see if the human beings can be saved from terrible choices, from sin, and brought to life by water and spirit. God in Jesus will face the power of every temptation and even in death. And will death get the last word? We know it happens because we celebrate on Easter. God in Jesus enters human experience. An analogy for me is our human immune system. We've been given everything we need to fight the diseases that plague us. Is there another one before that, Keith, of the body shape? Is it there? So this is a, a wonderful little slide I found of the immune system. And you can see all those lymph nodes and our, our tonsils, right, and our adenoids. How many people still have their tonsils and adenoids? My parents told me of a day when they always took them out, you know, but they're a part of our immune system. And the thymus, the hyperthymus, the spleen, you can see all these parts. And when we're getting sick, all those parts sort of hurt, don't they, when we're, our body's fighting something. This amazing immune system that God has given us to fight the diseases that come our way because we don't live in a bubble. We are exposed to germs every single day. And we have learned that cancer cells are moving in our body all the time. And when we're healthy and things are working, those cancer cells do not get to start doing their damage. And we have these amazing white blood cells that are given specific jobs. Can you see them here? Some of you know how to name these. I won't even try. But they have this amazing work that they're assigned to do to identify disease and things that are, don't belong there. And they clean us up and they keep us healthy. And for me, our immune system is one of the most amazing things that God has made for us. And yet this system, as you know, can break down because of age, because of stress, and sometimes we need an infusion from the outside. Sometimes we need a vaccination. Sometimes we need something to help us fight the evil within. We understand how we get sick with the flu, COVID, a cold, or even cancer. But ending the analogy, off with that slide, Keith. What about the power of sin that takes over all our decision-making, making us so that we hurt ourselves? and our relationships, and we totally miss the mark with God. We lose it. Jeremiah realizes that human, humanity does not have the capacity to heal itself or the power to do everything to be pure before God. And all the knowledge about God does not make one love God. 
So if we were to try to chart a course to God, human beings cannot get there from here. But the Holy Spirit comes and becomes our compass and our guide. And we can get to God's place, a place where we can make very good choices. And this work is all bathed in amazing grace. And God is not going for perfection in us. Now, if I was a Methodist pastor, I would not say that. <laughs> but I believe God is not going for perfection. God is asking us to invite Jesus into our lives and the Holy Spirit and experience grace-filled living. And so this new covenant that is cut for us on the cross is a gift, and it's available to everyone. And what about those previous covenants? Are they null and void? I believe in the mystery of God's providence. They are not null and void. And God will keep God's covenant. But I'm going to stand in the new covenant. And why hasn't everyone claimed this new covenant? In John chapter 12, there are some Greeks, you heard the passage, who come to Philip and say, Sir, we want to see Jesus. They have a sense of what they need to be looking for. And Jesus responds to this query by moving into a metaphor, telling them that the hour has come for the human being to be glorified. And as the rainbow is set in the sky as a sign of a covenant, as the stars and the sky and the sands of the sea were a sign of a promise to Abraham to be a great nation, Jesus is about to cut a new covenant. And he talks about a grain of wheat being willing to die so that new life can be born. There's something about being willing to die, like a grain of wheat, so that fruit can be born. Dying to bad choices, dying to willful and disobedient living, dying to voices that lead you away from loving God, yourself, and others. It's always a test when you're moving through a choice. Does this mean that I'm loving God? myself, and others. Jesus comes and judges the world guilty. And by facing death, he drives out the ruler of this world, whose only promise is death and destruction. Jesus enters this fallen world that is estranged from God, and in some ways on the cross performs an exorcism of the ruler of this world. Jesus, perfection in this world, exposes the systems that lead to violence. And the systems use violence, every kind, to silence Jesus. I grew up with a cartoon character by the name of Popeye the Sailor Man. I think my parents first brought it in so that I would eat spinach because I hated spinach. Now I like it. Not out of a can, though. And you see, Popeye in these cartoons had so much trouble in all of his relationships until he ate his spinach. And then he was super strong. And was he super strong so that he could love more and serve more? more? No, he got strong so he could beat up Bluto. You see, that's the model that the world gives us for living life. Use those gifts you've given, that strength you have to beat up others, to get ahead in this world. Dave and I watched the Academy Awards together this past weekend. We had seen none of the movies nominated for Best Picture. So we as a family watched Oppenheimer on Friday night. And we knew a lot of the story, but not the way it was told in this movie. So much editing to put together the past and the present and the future and the cosmos. It was really something to behold. 
human beings using our minds to manipulate the elements to create weapons of mass destruction. And yet lives were saved, lives were lost to bring an end to a terrible war. In the telling of this story, J. Robert Oppenheimer hoped that the threat of an A-bomb, an H-bomb, would lead to the deterrence of any future wars. As he struggled with the ramifications of all the work that these scientists had done. But this deterrence, we've watched it in our lifetimes, haven't we? And in this movie, there was no reference to God or God's gift in this telling of the story. And that's sort of true about our world today, isn't, often, isn't it? Oftentimes, God is left out. Because we can do this. We've got it. How's that working for us? Where are our choices leading us? I stated before that when I served in New Jersey, I had a chance to be around for the Center for Advanced Study at Princeton and other think tanks just to sit in and listen to these academics who were stating over and over again that our science is taking us to places we are not morally prepared to go. And that continues to be true. And so some people in our day want more laws, rulings, loud voices to make us right and pure. And Jeremiah tells us that there is a new covenant coming. And it is cut on a cross and it is sealed with blood. And that new covenant is available to all who are waiting to die to themselves and be alive to Christ. Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave his life for me. This is the foundation of our faith. And so we prepare to walk to the cross during Holy Week. And friends, I hope every day of our lives, always saying, Sir, ma'am, we wish to see Jesus. Amen and amen. As you are able, please prepare to stand as we join in singing a classic hymn, Lift High the Cross, a hymn that I first sang in processions with the cross lifted high. So may that image reign in your hearts as we sing together.